Uh, good afternoon, my name is Jose Roca. I'm the chief curator of the eighth Mercosul Biennial. Or I should say I was because it, it uh, ended a couple of weeks ago. And uh, here is Cuauhtémoc Medina, the curator of the upcoming Manifesta. We're going to present our respective shows. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we're going to talk a little about what a biennial is or should be. So, um, well, biennial, as we all know, it's a show we love to hate. Uh, there is no way to get it right, basically because they are mo most of them are basically a large thematic exhibition. As they, their name suggests, they are recurrent, but they are also discontinuous, and that's their main problem. Nothing happens between one incarnation and the next. And oftentimes, the local community, the artistic community, resents that enormous sums of money are funneled into a large, a single large art event, and nothing else happens. Uh, no there is no uh, more money available for other projects. So uh, when, when I was invited to do the Mercosul Biennial, I sort of had in mind that I could do a project that was not only an exhibition, or to put it in other terms, that the exhibitionary part was only a fraction of what I was going to do, and uh, that it, the rest of, uh, of the biennial should be about the real public for, for it, which is the local public, the local scene. So in terms of structure, I'm going to talk in, in a minute. But in terms of the, uh, the theme, I thought that I would choose a theme that could also be a, stra a strategy for curatorial action. So um, it uh, always struck me as very odd that a biennial would have the same name as a free trade agreement. It was, uh, you know, in, in, in current, uh, if you see the, in the current political situation, especially in Latin America, you would be hard pressed to find uh, an intellectual or an artist that sides with a uh, sides up with a free trade agreement, and yet they they chose to uh, name or, uh, themselves after um, the Mercosul, which stands for Mercado Común del Sur, Common Market of the South, which is uh, the Southern Cone's response to NAFTA. But uh, if you think that, as uh, Guy Debord said that uh, spectacle is capital to such a degree of accumulation that it becomes an image, then you can argue that biennials and the biennialism phenomena is probably the real uh, cultural logic of late capitalism. So I chose the idea of geopolitics as the underlying theme, the idea of nation, and I titled it Essays on Geopoetics. In terms of the structure, we had seven different components. Some of them, I call them uh, activating strategies. So they could or not lead to an exhibition, but their main purpose was to activate uh, the local scene. And the other ones were the uh, exhibitionary strategies, and I will talk a little about them. And then there was an important component, and this is what sets apart the Mercosul Biennial which, uh, from many other biennials in the world is that it, it is geared towards education. It's known as the Education Biennial. So I invited an artist and educator, Pablo Elguera, to do the um, education program, but not, uh, as it's often do, to curate a show and then give it to the education curator or the education department of the uh, biennial to do something for the public, but rather I invited him early on before inviting the other curators so he could articulate the pedagogical project through the curatorial. So uh, one of the um, ideas was to extend the action of the biennial in space and in time. So this is both. It's called Cadernos de Viaje and Travel Notebooks. And what we did was to invite nine artists um, to each one choose a route, a historical route of penetration in the state of Rio Grande do Sul. They traveled for weeks uh, by car or in a motorcycle, whatever. And then they produced piece, pieces that were shown in their point of destination as their Let's, let's say the travel notebooks, you know, the, the, the tests for what would become the, the completed piece that was shown many months after 
as a distinct exhibition as part of the biennial. So these are some images of that show. Another important component was called Casa M, as in Casa Mercosul. So we uh, chose to shorten to M, so to put the, put the stress on Casa, which is house, as you all know. So we rented a house, a two-story house, and we turned it into a small cultural center that resembles an artist-run space, only that it's financed by, with funds from the biennial. And this started in May. The biennial opened in September, so way before. And it, it has been, uh, we, we invited artists to design the furniture. We put uh, the archives of the biennial, wonderful archives that are very difficult to, to consult. Now they are, uh, they are there. Uh, and uh, every single artist that came to Porto Alegre gave a talk or uh, gave a presentation. And so the idea was to create a community for the biennial. So when it actually opened, there would be a community that knew about the issues. And we were discussing uh, the curating with the public uh, from the early stages at Casa Emi. And this project, which started in May, will last until December 15th. And there are talks of keeping it open. We don't know yet if it's going to happen. But anyways, it really fulfilled its purpose of becoming uh, like a hub for the discussions around the biennial. This is the last supper, uh, uh, the day that, we, that the curator has left. Uh, and uh, the only exhibitionary part of Casa M is a vitrine, and uh, we have a very intense program of um, activities every, every month. This is uh, one of the months. Uh, continents was also another component that didn't really, uh, mm, wasn't geared toward um, uh, exhibition. We basically, it was a strategy of Russian dolls. We gave money to a local art space a grant so that they could invite their peers from other parts of Latin America. So, for example, Serio Inspiración from Quito had for a month a temporary outpost in uh, Porto Alegre in this host space called Atelier Subterránea. They collaborated and then they produced some kind of thing. Sometimes it was a residency, sometimes it was a group show or a video screening, etc. And the idea is that this will uh, create a network and eventually will create more opportunities of visibility for the local art scene. Cidad No Vista was also uh, an, the idea of taking the theme, this idea of territory, but not as a theme, but also as a strategy for acting. So uh, the, the city of Porto Alegre was taken as a territory to be rediscovered through art, and we invited nine artists to do works that were ideally primarily not visual but sound pieces or smell pieces it ended up not being like that but for example this is the the mayor's office and uh, the artist Tatsunishi chose that part of the facade we built a huge um, um, structure that enabled people to climb there and once you got there you had this sort of um, room constructed around the facade and you had another way to uh, sort of um, uh, relate to uh, the architectural landmarks in the city. And Alain Fronteiras, Beyond Frontiers, was a guest curator show that I um, invited uh, the legendary curator from Sao Paulo, Aracia Amaral, to do. And she also invited uh, artists. They traveled extensively in the region and she mixed new pieces that were conceived for the show with um, archaeological pieces um, uh, landscape painting from the different uh, museums in the region in a very strange and suggestive uh, uh, show. Um, also, uh, another of the exhibitionary uh, strategies was a one-person show of Eugenio Didburn, which I did. And as you know, Didburn in the mid-80s uh, came with this idea of the airmail paintings, which are works of art that are folded and sent into an envelope to the place where uh, Didburn is invited, and they travel as a letter, and then are deployed as, um, as a painting, um, in a way uh, bypassing censorship and the difficulties of working in, uh, in his case, in Chile. And finally, Geopoetics, which was like the main show, what you would sort of conventionally 
term the biennial. In fact, it was just, as I, as I explained, part of it. So I decided to curate, curate, curate it as a thematic show about the idea of nation, and which means that uh, I didn't invite artists to do new works, but rather selected specific pieces from existing works. And in some cases, there were new pieces, but in fact, it was all about creating this narrative about different issues regarding uh, nation, like uh, cartography, politics, uh, the n birth of the nation state, uh, migra migration, uh, conflict, etc. So this is how it was put together. And some images of the exhibition design, which uh, was based on the idea of what is the bare minimum to, for a piece to be experienced without loss and yet have a dialogue with other works in the exhibition. So these are some images of that, of the, of the main show, Geopoetics. And finally, the pedagogical project, which was really important uh, because this biennial has an attendance of uh, nearly half a million, but it serves uh, a large uh, school and university population. So Paulo Elguera uh, and I uh, worked hard on, 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 on this part of, the, of the, this component. Uh, we published a book, a reader, on uh, important texts on mediation in museums that were formerly unavailable in Portuguese. Uh, so that became a, 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 it will become a textbook, I think, for everyone interested in museums uh, and mediation. And uh, they produced several different materials, so the biennial wouldn't be used only by the art teachers to teach art, but also geography, history, uh, literature and art, of course, and a special, uh, you know, a booklet for uh, preschool. And uh, we also did something that we I find important is that uh, every bi biennial curator tries to come up with a new project that doesn't take into account what has happened in the past. What we did was to ask two uh, important uh, art educators to do an evaluation of all of the materials that had been done in the past biennials to see if they had indeed worked or not, and also uh, do an evaluation and assessment of our own project. To, uh, and that will uh, yield uh, a report that will be useful for the next curator. And uh, uh, we, early on, like one, a uh, year prior to the opening, we started a blog and we reported on all of our travels on the curating and sort of putting uh, our ideas in, in, into the public. And I, the first uh, blog entry was called the Duo de Calogo. The, it was like a manifesto of biennial curating, uh, which, where I said what I thought a biennial shouldn't be. And uh, it, there were 20 points, it's uh, very dogmatic, and I tried to to sort of go by it, and uh, it's on the web, it's uh, a little tongue-in-cheek, and I invite you guys to take a look at it um, as a sort of, um, to, to, for me to be held accountable of. Thank you. Well, I'm Coltemoc Medina, and as Jose Roca mentioned, I'm in charge of uh, Manifesto 9. I think they need to switch the, the, the visuals, but that's not, okay. Uh, and I will pretend that I'm not going to read, <laughs> because <laughs> luckily I actually wrote something. Uh, I would start by saying that um, I'm not going to hide that I don't belong to the lot that despairs about the extraordinary expansion of the biennial system around the world. Beyond the fact that I find it intellectually and ethically problematic to criticize the proliferation of biennials, and a minute later, allow oneself to produce, comment, contribute, consume, or worse, make a living out of them, as if they were some sort of necessary evil. I'm alleged that is not altogether unfrequent amongst critics, curators, and artists of my generation. I am very aware of the fact that the energy resources 
and the hopes that are uh, invested in, the, in them are the result of a very important historical process. In my view, the more than 100 uh, biennials that take place each year around the world are the still unresolved battleground of the close to 30, of, of a 30 year long war of inclusion and the redefinition of the geopolitics of cultural globalization. Starting with the Havana Biennial in 1984, the South broke the defense lines of the ancien regime of the international modernist art world that comprised, if you think about it, the imaginary monopo monopoly of NATO nations of the North Center above the so-called periphery of artistic cultures conceived back then as artistically and culturally ancillary in comparison to the metro metropoles of modernism. And you can actually check what we, if, that what we call the center is not, nothing but what NATO in reality was. Now, independently of how interesting or terrible each biennial is, the instability of the current redistribution of temporary centers in a myriad of events around the world, that is a stage each time a biennial happens, always gives the expression to what I feel is an anthropological contemporary condition. The idea and the need of staging in space and time the so-called contemporary as a, cycle, as a cyclic ceremony of investing a temporary geographical center for visual, cultural, and political narratives that, differently from the past, migrates and evaporates as, they, as the biennials cross the seas and the continents. Indeed, I believe that biennials are one of the forms in which hypermodernity both reflects on its own time and gives a shape and space to that time, and that ceremony is valuable in terms of turning our anxiety to act and understand contemporary culture into a self-reflective machine. So rather than lamenting that biennials always have a certain circus quality, I am aware that they stand for the potential of reshaping this art world as a space for the display of a critical and geographical complexity that actually turns into some sort of geographical and art historical fantasy land. In fact, I'm trying to explain that I find them as, a, as uh, similar to a non-religious rituality of production and demolition of the plurality of cultural centers where the relevance of cultural and art practice is tested against different social and cultural settings institutional structures and audiences. However, when I was invited to participate in the run or the contest for Manifesta 9 a year and a, a half ago, I arrived with a number of prejudices and disgruntledness that relate specifically to the reasons behind the project that I'm going to try to stage starting on May 31st in the city of Genk in Belgium, actually in the Belgian Limburg. A, in the same way, and that's actually where we, that's the imaginary center that will happen next summer, the center of Europe. In the same way that many theorists have argued that museum project, the museums project the ghost of the cemetery, the resting place of the remains of neutralized or dead culture, there is a moment in the recent years that biennials are running the risk of reminding another kind of heterotopic apparatus. The increasing indo industrialized art biennials with their lack of internal segmentations, hundreds of contemporary artists and dozens of sites, 
but above all, thousands of hours of videos, films, talks, and actions, which normally demand from both professional and amateur viewers days of hectic and always incomplete absorption, that massive scale, to be technical, that colossal overpowering of ourselves as, as subjects, seems to me to point to another kind of species of the depository of the death, the promiscuity of mass graves, mingling bones and half-rotten fragments of the unborn and the undead. I'm trying to say that a great deal of what I'm going, I'm going to do has to do to counteract the image that was to a great extent inspired by the Sao Paulo Biennial and the censored sculpture of Nuno Ramos that had some vultures on top of a, of a cage, that in reality biennials are becoming these mass graves that lack structures, lack intellectual accesses and lack the understanding of a process of cultural experience as a whole. At the same time, but, and I'm going to actually claim, because I, I don't like to leave things without names and places, that's something that my friends know, that shows us as the, as the last curat curated section of the 54th Venice Biennial, that lacked any understandable argument, appeared to me as an accumulative leftover of a mammoth catastrophe. Just attest to this nightmare, the idea that Bainas just record the overproduction of visual culture at the age of the so-called art world, which very frequently is in danger of judging its products in terms of the conjuring of a measurement of power, money, prestige, and all the kinds of components, what I actually believe is contemporary kitsch. On the other hand, so that's the biennial. I also feel uncomfortable on the way the biennials, because of the logical connection with the idea of exhibitions as sites of production, have delegated in the recent years all the need of mediating between the tensions of the locality and the interest of global culture, of the history and the present, of people and objects, of actions and thinking into the abuse of two forms, two specific kinds of art forms. Frequently half-baked community-based projects that run the risk, let me just jump into something that I know, again, just names. Frequently have vague community projects that run the risk of becoming a mere academy of experiences and affections, if not a kindergarten of experiment. And the banalization that we have all contributed to of site specificity, <laughs> that forces audiences to absorb a biennial as a fragmented touristic pilgrimage with no coherence as a whole. I don't have anything against these two genres in themselves. I am actually historically guilty of a number of those operations. However, and especially in Europe, it seems to me that it could be interesting to run against the given logic of understanding biennials and, produ and the production of art as a mere response to a site by artists and curators landing from parachutes into a known situation. In other words, I thought that making manifesta, and you need to understand that there is something odd that somebody that actually understands is uh, non-European. I, I would actually argue that one of the advantages of being Latin American is that you, you understand that non-European is actually a category that mm -hmm. has a meaning. Yeah. Uh, making manifesta could involve rethinking the exhibition, the notion of exhibition, as a political and complex cultural operation. But also that this intention could try to avoid the temptation of making an abstracted show. And I'm unluckily going to say that that is what I feel about the recent Istanbul, that it's a show that is abstracted in terms 
of thinking that it can be imagined just happening anywhere without any specific relationship and any specific interpolation to the site, to the people, and to the historical situation. So I started with the hope that the exhibition could retain a connection with the site and a social intentionality, and at the same time be conceived as a space of cultural pro and intellectual production, but all of that understanding the exhibition as a means of a social intervention. So, in other words, the task of intervening was, is not going to be about displaying a number of gestures of sociability. No, it will rely on a certain faith on the effects of exhibitions. That is in the mediation and complex ability of exhibitions to produce a local situation that can work in terms of the ways of thinking and the common places that dominate a specific moment in time. So Manifesta 9 that will open the next main 31st in Genk, sorry, I'm going to, I, I show you already the map, no? The Belgian city just across the border from Maastricht is a place, I need to mention, that is marked by the race and dismantling of coal mining in less than a century. It's a place that is entirely producing its economy, its social fabric, its population by a short lived but very intense process of coal mining. Well, opening mani manifesting gang will involve to try to use the migratory character of the Manifesta Biennial to propose a complex cultural object. In fact, Manifesta 9 will not be just a contemporary art biennial. Under the general title, The Deep of the Modern, and you understand that deep has a certain anachronistic uh, sense, as a sense of a hellish uh, component, Manifesta 9 will, above all, involve the synergy of three components. Not three projects, but three components of a, of a show. One, first, in collaboration with the, oh, I actually put you the second one. That's a mistake of mine. Oh, there's something wrong with this. Um, is it possible to go back? Sorry, I think that that's why I'm having troubles with it, because every time I go, okay, sorry, okay. One, in collaboration with Greek-Belgian curator Katerina Gregos, I'm working in a deliberately reduced and therefore accountable, uh, Pablo Elguera once made the joke that contemporary, that biennial curators need to make shows with more than 150 artists because there was a statistic possibility that there would be 10 that they will remember <laughs> and actually claim a success afterwards. Anyway, in collaboration with, 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 with Katrina Gregos, I'm making a deliberately reduced and accountable contemporary exhibition with contributions of only 35 to 40 artists that are, have been selected on the basis of very extensive research I visited around 250 studios, beyond the things that I, I knew. And they've been chosen in terms of finding interesting works, not only artists, but works, that are focused on the aesthetic responses to the global economic restructuring of the present. That is, there will be artists that whose work consistently addresses issues such as the process of regional industrialization and deindustrialization, the relocation of the industrial stronghold of civilization to the former periphery, the transformation of the concept of production and work, and the memory of industrial, an industri industrial society and its continuity into the future. I mean, one of the goals of the shows is to actually locate the notion of post-industrialism as a regional element of another industrial phase. Second, in, a, in, a, in direct tension and relationship with such contemporary works, but in a different place, I'm collaborating with British 
art historian Don Addis in creating an experiment of art history. An essay, or if you, if you may, or if you would allow me to call it that way, of a materialist art history once historical materialism has become just history. Mm -hmm. This section is called The Age of Coal, and is my headache, and intends in 10 chapters to chronicle the ways art and visual production, particularly in Europe, was transformed in, from the beginning of the 19th century until very recently by the centrality of coal in the modern civilization. That is, the way coal was the main fuel of the Industrial Revolution, the way coal involves knowledge as a fossil, as a fossil, the way coal created social structures, and the way coal produced a different natural environment. Uh, this exhibition, therefore, explores the way our history can be read from a material component beyond social representation. And it will involve, of course, the not altogether easy attempt to show works coming from institutions and, and, and collections in a specifically built uh, space within what is actually an industrial ruin. Finally, Manifesta intends to use the exhibition site as an attempt to intervene in the social imaginary of what industrial heritage means, both in the Belgian Limburg and around the world. Through an exhibition title, 17 Tones, and the title refers both to a work by Duchamp and to the most famous song of coal mining in the world, actually an American song. We are collaborating with agents who are possessed by the task or the duty of keeping the heritage, the memory, and the energy that was produced by coal mining. Fashion designers, ex-miners that have archives and museums, historical collections, natural collections, and popular cultural practitioners, whose work is defined by carrying the question of transforming something of a bygone economic mode of production into forms of contemporary culture. This is, of course, displaying the energy of a creative cultural field without allowing it to be instrumentalized by artists. So creating a mediation instead of just expecting direct intervention from the artistic field. In the attempt to demonstrate that there's something to produce beyond the dichotomy of nostalgia and the fear of the return of the past. That is particularly central to the questions that surround the culture of places that used to have coal mining. Anyway, the whole event will also be sanding against the phantom of that very, very same heritage. One of the important decisions of the curatorial team has been to concentrate the whole initiative in a single exhibition space, the extraordinary ruin of the building of the Butters High Mine in Genk, a 24,000 square meter skeleton standing next to the blocked passages into the underworld and the slag heap that produces the artificial landscape of this region. As you can imagine, when you have 24,000 square meters to show something, you're not really particularly uh, worried about finding space to exhibit. So what we intend to do is make an exhibition that involves a rich and complex argument made with the specific elements and components with differences and intellectual input, some sort of a small encyclopedia, or if you may, a sub-cyclopedia of the role of production in history and our lives. This is because 
the curatorial team of Manifesta 9 is convinced that our biennials are meant to be the high voltage temporary centers of cultural self-reflectivity of the conflicts, tensions, narratives, and possibilities of globalized capitalism today. And that, that's, and that those structures lend themselves easily to appear superficially as homogeneous, not because of being biennials, but as a result of our collective inability to explore their possibilities. That is, is not a matter of the malaise of biennials, it's a matter of the need of finding other curatorial practices. And that would be the presentation Great. of something that doesn't exist. <laughs> so. Okay. So, uh, what are we meant to do? Are we meant to take questions or to? Yeah, to take questions. But I had one question for you, because uh, biennials, well, they have this thing that they are discontinuous and all that I talked about at first. But still, they manage over time to create a context. So. The Sao Paulo Annual, for example, has been going on for more than 50 years, and over the years, you know, in 53, they've, they showed the Picasso's Guernica. So they have been shown the art of uh, the time to the audience in Sao Paulo. So in a way, it has become a temporary museum for that city or for that country. But the Manifesta is a very strange biennial because it's like a fran franchise that different cities aspire to, one gets selected, and then it's, it's a one-off. So Manifesta, it's a sort of um, a context on its own in the, in the sense that you remember, oh, the, the Manifesta in Chipre that didn't happen, or the Manifesta in Frankfurt, but the cities only had one incarnation each. So how do you think this will be read in relation to this idea of a biennial as uh, an instance of creation of of local infrastructure and local well, history? Um, on the one hand, I would say that precisely Manifesta embodies that condition of the Vineyards as a migrating center. It's actually the representation of the process as it happens in general. I mean, that nomadic character, beyond the fact that it's a very wise uh, management structure, because it's basically trying to tap on cultural resources that are located in places that don't have a continuous institution that's actually using them. I mean, that's clearly one reason why uh, 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 an object like Manifesta happens, because there's a certain availability of cultural resources that is located in places that don't necessarily have a clear, a clear uh, project in terms of cultural production. Beyond that, it precisely involves this nomadic creation of a center that actually has to do with other practices that with which we shape, ta shape time, from Olympic Games to wars. I'm going to put it in, in, mm -hmm. in those terms. The, the way we actually shape time in our, in our narrative has to do with that kind of emergence of points that become momentarily centers. So one thing that we are trying to do is to intervene into the cultural tension that is happening there. I mean, there are three factors. One, okay, this is a coal mining region. There was practically nobody there. The population was basically brought from many other places around Europe and the world. So it is a population that is not a long historical, ethnically based uh, community. It's not a community of cultural or artistic consumers. There are practically no uh, uh, institutions there. So one important element in the project is to build the concept of an audience, mm -hmm. making a historical show, creating this object of, of knowledge, is directly aimed to doing that, not to, uh, not to pretend that people are forced to take contemporary art for granted as culture. Right. Secondly, there is an intention that I hope will be also effective for the, for the uh, public at large, of creating through that show a view on the history of modernism that is not there in the bibliography. I mean, there are certain issues that we are trying to tackle that I am ready to claim that are not discussed in the academic 
uh, and, and the museum uh, world. There is also, but the, the most important move is that in a certain way there is a gap, and that's not uh, peculiar of Limburg, it's a gap that we find in many places around the world, in particular in Europe, where you find specific communities that are charged with what I call the energy of memory, that are practically uh, leaving the militancy of keeping a relation to a certain industrial past. And on the other hand, you have a society that actually doesn't know what to do with that relationship. More, more generally speaking, I'm going to claim that one of the effects of capitalism is that we don't have a clear idea what history is for in any way. I mean, we are, I feel that the, the excess of artworks related to history is actually an indication that history is not working, that we don't know what to do with that, with that structure. So one thing we are trying to do is to imagine that there will be an effect in changing the view on what heritage is, from looking at it as a ruin that you don't know what to do with it, and actually looking at it as a, as a cultural field. But do you expect the biennial to leave something afterwards? Because That's what we are trying to do on, I mean solely. What we are trying to do, but, but what we want to leave is a change in the assumptions of the common sense of the region, basically. That the modernizing society finds that the question of, of coal mining is not the past, but is the present that inhabits them. We want to empower the museum and the miners that are doing that job so that they find a certain uh, ear in the, in the society. And we want also to intervene in locating these kind of places as places that people recognize as, the, as their centers. But we are, what we're trying to do is to mobilize art at the service of that, right. rather than expecting that that is thematized by, by the artworks. I think we are about to be over time from, or we are over time. Okay. So, the, okay. so, so thank you for coming. Thank and you for coming. Yeah.